let's start to actually tie this into uh, streamwise and crosswise vorticity. So to illustrate uh, crosswise vorticity, you first have to take a look at a slightly different photograph here. But it's the same idea as we go up in the atmosphere. You can see that the direction, as you draw these lines from these points to the center of the uh, center of the graph here, the direction doesn't change very much. So from about zero kilometers to two kilometers, the wind doesn't change direction very much in that depth of the atmosphere. In fact, it really doesn't change direction very much at all throughout the course of the troposphere. And uh, the first thing that you want to do to diagnose streamwise and crosswise vorticity is first you want to find this open circle labeled RM. So again, that's the direction that a right-moving supercell or a cyclonic supercell would want to would want to move in this wind profile. And you first want to take a take a look at what that storm motion vector is. So in this case, the storm would want to move east southeast at a speed of roughly 30 knots, which is about 35 to 40 miles per hour. And then from there, that gives you the storm motion vector. Now to get what's referred to as the storm relative motion vector, you draw a line connecting this open circle to a particular point on the photograph. Here I'm going to be using the uh, altitudes of one to two, one kilometer, two kilometer to illustrate this. So here I'm going to draw the storm relative motion vector uh, at one kilometer and the storm relative motion vector at two kilometers. And that's represented by these blue arrows, these light blue arrows. And by storm relative motion, that's basically uh, what this the it's basically what the ambient field looks like with the storm's motion subtracted out of the equation. So let's to sort of get an idea of how this works. Let's say you've got a storm that's moving due east at 50 miles per hour, and then you get inside of a car and also start driving due east at 20 miles at say 20 miles per hour. From the storm's perspective, you're moving east at around 30 miles per hour. That's what we mean by storm relative motion and to sort of tie that back into the atmosphere, if you've got a storm that's moving east-southeast at 30 miles per hour, or 30 knots, I should say 30 knots, and the wind is west-southwest at around 15 knots, then from the storm's perspective, the wind is really something like this. I guess that's about, uh, that's about 15 knots in the west-northwest direction. So that's what we mean by storm relative motion. We're subtracting out the storm's motion from the ambient wind field to get an idea of what the storm sees from its quote-unquote perspective. And the other thing that you want to draw is the vorticity vectors. And the way that the vorticity vectors are drawn on photographs is the vorticity vectors point outward and normal to the line that you trace out on the photograph. So in this case, the line pretty much moves something like this in the direction of the mouse cursor, and then normal and outward would be vorticity vectors pointing something like that. And if you take a look at these uh, vorticity vectors and the storm relative motion vectors, so again, the blue arrows and the red arrows, you can see that the, comp the red arrows aren't really pointing in the same direction as the storm relative motion. In fact, uh, a purely and this is what we refer to as crosswise vorticity, a purely crosswise vorticity pattern, which is rarely seen in the atmosphere, uh, will have a horizontal vorticity vector that's pointing 90 degrees to the storm relative motion vector. But we don't often see that in the actual atmosphere, but it can happen. So if you've got a component of vorticity that's pointing 90 degrees to the, uh, 90 degrees to the storm relative motion vector, that means you've got a component of crosswise vorticity. And as far as physical consequences in the atmosphere is concerned, if you've got an environment with a lot of crosswise vorticity, that means you've got an environment that's going to favor splitting thunderstorms. That is, thunderstorms that split inside, into a northern half and a southern half, uh, versus streamwise vorticity, which will favor uh, storms rapidly uh, intensifying the rotation along one particular direction. Which is usually, uh, a, in the, usually in the case of the northern hemisphere, if you've got strong streamwise vorticity, then you've got uh, very strong cyclonic supercells or very uh, rapidly rotating cyclonic supercells. But let's take a look at in a case that has a lot of streamwise vorticity, which is shown up on the screen here. So again, same process as before. Green arrow telling us what direction the storms actually want to move. So in this case, east-northeast at just over 40 knots. I think the actual number here is 43 knots. And again, storm relative motion vectors. So again, we just simply draw the uh, arrow from the open circle to the points that we're interested in. So we're interested in, in this case, as an example, we're looking at the wind at one kilometer and the wind at two kilometers. And in this case, you see that the vorticity vectors are now pointing almost in the same direction as the storm relative motion vectors. And this is what we look for when we're going to look at, look for, say, streamwise vorticity. And this will indicate an environment where uh, the storms, instead of splitting, will tend to rotate more intensely as they become more and more organized, as the updrafts become more and more mature. And 
usually you'll have a lot of streamwise vorticity when you've got a strong curvature in this photograph. So if I go back to the previous photograph where you see where you see the photograph's pretty straight, there's not a lot of curvature in the photograph, that indicates a lot of crosswise vorticity is present in the atmosphere, which means you're going to get a lot of splitting thunderstorms. But if you've got really strong curvature in the photograph, you're going to have a lot of streamwise vorticity, which means the thunderstorms are going to be taking in a lot of spinning air, which means the thunderstorms themselves are going to spin, are going to want to spin pretty rapidly. And of course, spinning thunderstorms uh, can be very consequential in the atmosphere because if you've got a supercell thunderstorm that's got a lot of rotation in it, then it's much more likely to produce something like a tornado. Or even to some extent, a strongly rotating supercell can also produce a lot of straight line wind damage and also some very large hail. So, but usually what we look for, the main hazard that we diagnose from the photograph is the potential for tornadoes. How much do the thunderstorms actually want to spin? And the way that we diagnose that is using this idea of streamwise vorticity. And one of the physical parameters that's used to quantify how much streamwise vorticity is present in the atmosphere is something called storm relative helicity. And you can get sort of a rough idea of what this value is by looking at the, if you the way that we, uh, so in this example, we're taking a look at the surface to one or the zero to one kilometer storm relative velocity. And the way that you actually calculate that is first you have to calculate the area of this, which involves some integration, which you're not going to have to do in the lab, but I just want to give you a sort of a conceptual bearing on how this actually works. So the way you calculate storm relative velocity is again, you find your open circle that's labeled RM. And then if you want, say, zero to one kilometer, surface to one kilometer storm relative helicity, you connect one point with the zero kilometer marker, the zero kilometer point on the photograph. So you connect the open circle labeled RM to your surface wind on the photograph. And then you do the same thing for the wind at one kilometers on the photograph. And then the area that you trace out there, that is in fact the storm relative helicity measurement. And we'll talk more about this when we get into the severe weather unit, but in this particular case, there's a lot of storm relative velocity. This area being traced out is very large, so the atmosphere is very conducive for rotating thunderstorms. Another common parameter that you'll see, again, this is storm relative velocity, but another common value that you'll see is a 0 to 3 kilometer storm, rel storm relative velocity, but it's the same idea. So instead of so instead of connecting it with the 0 and 1 kilometer uh, markers, we connect it with the 0 and 3 kilometers. So again, draw a line from the open circle to the zero kilometer marker or to the altitude that we're interested in, which is the surface, which is at the zero kilometer marker. And then we again connect a line from the open circle to the three kilometer altitude marker. And the area that we trace out from that is the storm relative velocity. And again, there's a lot of storm relative velocity in this photograph. So those storms are really gonna be spinning when they go up. But that's gonna do it for this, uh, this segment on photographs. Hopefully that makes sense for the most part. If not, then you have my email address and you can uh, email me questions, but uh, that's all. Your, that should be all the material you'll need to know to complete the lab. So with that, that concludes lab seven.